Oh, hey, look at Eric jive into that dad music. Just, just jamming out. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Dying Out Loud. It's Tuesday, December 5th, 2023. And you're on the line, the Dying Out Loud show with Dave Warnock and Eric. How you doing, Eric? Doing pretty good, Dave. How about you? Glad to have you with me tonight. It's fun. Yeah, We've this, been knowing each other a while. Yeah, it was our first yeah. time on a screen together, so I'm privileged. Yeah, well, I'm glad to have you. How have you been doing? How's your week? It's been going good. Uh, I spent uh, over a week in Las Vegas for the Amazon tech conference that's over there every year. So I got back a couple of days ago. So I'm kind of finally like decompressed and back to my usual yeah. routine and working Worst those calories I built the there off. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, Vegas I is my hometown. That's why I, so I spent many there. winters there. Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, it's my hometown. Yes, my hometown. So I spent many winters there. And um, so I'm kind of used to it. But I did notice that, yeah, my skin was drying out pretty bad. I don't think my body's really acclimated to it anymore since I've lived in Washington for like a decade now. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, I have been um, pondering this week. Um, pondering is a word my friend Steve used to use. He had a he had a place on the river in Arkansas. We'd go and sit uh, in the water and drink beer. And he had a a place there called the pondering hole. Um, and if it's maybe a Southern thing, the, the word ponder, which, you know, to me, yeah. it's just thinking about stuff, you know, and Steve, if you've, any of you've read my book, he is who I've dedicated the book to. He and I were pastors together years ago in Arkansas and I deconstructed and he didn't, but he actually died before I deconstructed. He died suddenly. And um, it's what I've been thinking about this week because a couple of people I know have lost people this week rather suddenly. Um, and Steve was taken from us suddenly at a, at a weird accident. A tree fell on him on his property and Oof. just broke his neck and uh, went from talking. I had moved to Tennessee by this time. and. And we went to talking once or twice a week to me getting a phone call that he was dead. Um, and the suddenness of it is jarring. And that's the thing about life is that it's so brief, um, unpredictable, um, incredibly precious. So a friend of mine lost a friend of hers this week. Suddenly she didn't, she didn't know. He was even sick and he goes in the hospital and doesn't come out. And wow. another friend of mine uh, had a college friend that she had reconnected with a few years ago and they had become, you know, they knew each other 35 years ago, but then they reconnected uh, in the last five years um, and began to foster a friendship again. And then politics got in the way of that. Turns out he was a supporter of Trump and was a, QAnon kind of guy and and that got in the way of their renewed friendship and then she just finds out this week that he's gotten pancreatic cancer over the last few months and died and she had lost touch with him because <clears throat> politics tend to drive a wedge between us these days as does religion i have a daughter who is estranged from me uh through her choice because of my apostasy, as she would call it. And I've just been thinking about those kinds of things in life and how tragic it is that we lose touch with one another um, or something drives a wedge between us. Uh, someone can offend me and I get all offended and, I, and I, sh I shut them out or they shut me out because I did something that hurt them or offended them and 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 then years go by and those bridges are never mended and i just think it's tragic and what i want to say tonight is hold the ones close to you that you have because you don't know what what time we have i'm acutely aware of this because i deal with als every day and as my as my disease progresses i'm more and more aware of how precious the time I have left is. And I want to make sure all the time that I don't miss it, that I don't um, squander it, if you will. Or 
I want to make sure that I'm maximizing the time with the people I care about. And not only spending time, but making sure that I say the things to them that I should say, that we have those moments that I talk about. I don't know. That's what's been on my mind. <laughs> Starting off with a heavy load. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in my recent trip to Vegas, I was actually visiting an old childhood friend of mine that I haven't seen for probably over 20 years. Um, oh, wow. She and her husband. Yeah, she and her husband. I wasn't sure if they were still Jehovah's Witnesses or not. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm an ex-Jehovah's Witness. Very cult-like religion. Uh, very insulated, exclusionary. If you're not one of them, you are not a friend. You aren't even a family member. Uh, if if they were to be following right, the rules. Some right. witnesses are a little loose with that. But yeah, and we were catching up on 20, 25 years of not you know, talking to each other at all. And uh, one of the things we talked about was just catching up on people that we knew in our congregation as we were growing up. Like what happened to this person? What happened to that person? And there was mm -hmm. a few deaths in there. And it's sad because, um, because of the way the religions operate their religion and the way we see other cults also operate, including political cults and, and such, where if somebody's been given the mentality, someone develops mentality of my family member, if they don't agree with me on this particular issue, I should stop talking to them. Mm -hmm. Or uh, this right. person's a potentially bad influence and may pull me out. I need to cut them off. Um, and years go by and you're wasting like these people. And I, I was like this too, back when I was in, you're wasting the precious time you have. And yeah, there's a it. lucky few that there's a lucky few that realize, Hey, uh, either the religions bunk and they leave and they rejoin their friends or they realize, Hey, um, maybe I should be using this time that I have. Maybe I don't necessarily have the guarantee that I think I do about the next life to come. Mm -hmm. And I need to start using my time now. Um, and just kind of really punctuate that uh this this couple that i was or this you know uh, uh these friend this friend or her husband i was meeting um i remember she reached out to me 10 years ago on like facebook saying hey let's hang out and have a dinner and at that point i was relatively fresh out of my deconversion i didn't know whether she was still in or not and i was actually apprehensive to even meet her so i actually ignored mm -hmm. the message because mm -hmm. i was afraid that if we met they might ask some questions and if they're still in and they realize I'm out now, they'll start spreading that information to everybody else that I care about and I'll eventually be shunned. And so I didn't, right. I didn't respond back and I waited another 10 years for all I finally did. That was 10 years of catching up. We could have done a long time ago. Um, uh, or rather that was 10 years ago. We could have started catching up instead of now. Uh, yeah. so yeah, it's just, uh, you gotta, sometimes you gotta kind of just be bold, be brave and, and kind of seize yeah, life. Take a chance, um, yeah. take a chance, seize the day, seize life. I know that there yeah. are situations that are toxic relationships that are harmful to you emotionally or mentally. And you need to, sometimes you, you have to have boundaries that are healthy and you have to take care of yourself. But more often than not, it's just time slips by, we're not aware of it, or there's some offense that has happened and we don't make the effort to heal it or fix it. I'm, I'm reminded of a scripture, which often happens to me, <laughs> this former pastor. And it, it's really, a, it's a good sentiment. It, it says, loosely, it says, as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men. And I think that's a good tenet to live by. You can't be at peace with everyone because sometimes they won't let you. But as much as it is within me, I want to be the kind of person that is okay with anyone and everyone. And if you want to do life with me, if you want to have a relationship with me, I'm willing to do that, even if we disagree on things. And again, that's with the caveat that it's not unhealthy or not uh, uh a dysfunctional or an abusive relationship, those kind of things yeah. you do need to take care of yourself on. But yeah, reach out, take the chance, spend the moments, spend the time, make the phone call, have the coffee, have the drink, and just don't let life slip through your fingers because you don't know when it's going to end. You don't know how long we have. I, I, I have a little, um, I have a little flashlight on my ending because of my disease. So I talk about dying out loud because of that. But we can all live that way as though 
this could be it. This could be my last day. This could be the last week I live on earth. This could be the last person I talk to. This could be the last relationship. This, any of that. So I, I think at times we just have to remind ourselves of that. And we do that a lot on this show. That's a lot of what this is about. Um, but it never hurts to refresh that, I guess. Absolutely. Anyway. It, it can be very, um, it can be, I'll, I'll, I'll put one last sentence on that. It can be very easy to get so caught up in your life that you start forgetting to remember those things and, and time can just slip away from you. So yeah, absolutely. Take advantage yeah, of that. Reach really out to can. somebody that you've been thinking of and yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Let's talk to D because I think, uh, that's who, uh, actually I was talking about earlier. Let's uh, talk to D. She, her in Tennessee. D, you're on the line with Dave and Eric. Hi, Dave. Hi, Eric. Hey there. We know Hi, you, D. D. <laughs> yeah. Stacy, Eric, it's Stacy's, Stacy's mom. mom. Mm -hmm. Ah, hi, D. How you doing? Hi. Well, well I've had kind of a crappy uh, week. I, yeah. Tell us. We. I, I just was talking about that. You probably heard so. Tell us about that and, yeah. and your thoughts in regard to that. Yeah, well, and, and your conversation has actually made me think about my dad. So I called in because I lost William this week, my good friend who he didn't even know he was sick until recently. And the last we spoke was last Monday, and he said he was fine. Good news that, you know, it wasn't cancer. And then... He went to sleep Wednesday and just died in his sleep. And I still don't know what happened. And, and anyway, and it, I realized in my, my moments of quiet this week, what I was upset about was um, it's the first time I've really been sad that I don't believe in heaven anymore because, uh, mm. you know, we used, we used to be like, well, it's okay, we'll see them again. And... Mm -hmm. I don't have that anymore. And as much as I, I'm glad there's 99 other reasons out of a hundred that I'm so happy that I don't have all that fantasy that I have to believe in anymore. That's the one thing that I sure wish I had still. Um, anyway, that being said, mm -hmm. um, William was staunch atheist and he would not be happy with me for wishing for that fantasy. And we spoke every single day from the day we met. We spoke every day until he got sick about a month ago. And then it was very sporadic. And I just knew something was wrong. And we we just didn't know how serious it was, I guess. But um the last we spoke, the very last words he said to me were, I love you, my friend, and I'll cherish that. And I have it in print because mm. we spoke over Facebook Messenger so I can look back at our conversations and I cherish that. I'll cherish that. Now, what you guys were just talking about as I was waiting on hold were not letting um, relationships, you know, um, if you can patch things up, patch them up. If you can make a phone call, make a phone call, go out for a drink, whatever. Well, my dad, um, he died in 1999 and we hadn't spoken for a few years. And that was his choice. It, it wasn't mine. He was upset with me because I was married to someone who was extremely abusive. And um, I actually have told my story on um, mine and Stacy's show. So it's there. It's, it, I didn't go into as bad of a story as it was. I told enough without telling everything. But my dad one day just said, look, as long as you're with that man, I cannot see it. I cannot talk to you. I don't want anything to do with you as long as you're with him. And in retrospect, every time I think about it, I get upset because he was my dad. And he should have wanted to be there almost as a way to kind of keep an eye on me. but. He chose not to do that. He chose to just bow out of my life because he didn't like the man I was married to. And then mm. when um, he was so close, when he was, 
You're dying. I got a phone call from um, his sister, and we lived in British Columbia, and um, he was dying in Washington State. And she said, D, you need to just come here because your dad's dying. Now, um, that was July the 2nd, and we did talk on Father's Day, which was in June. Uh, it was the first time I'd spoken to him since he said he didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. And he was in his hospital bed and he said, I have cancer. Um, I'm going to be okay, but I do have cancer. And um, at, le- we, at least we did speak, but that was the first time we'd spoken in years and it was in his deathbed. And I didn't know it was his deathbed. Anyway, so. On July the 2nd, 1999, when my aunt phoned me and she said, look, you need to get here however you can because he's not going to make it. And so um, I got in the car and I got right down to Washington State. And apparently all day long they've been saying, just hang on, Jamie, D's coming, just hang on. And he was in what they call a metabolic coma. And they say, and I don't know how they know this, but they say that they could, when they're in a metabolic coma, they can hear what's going on, but they just can't respond to you. And when I got there, everyone cleared out of the room and left me alone with him. And I held his hand and I just said, I'm here. And he literally took his last breath and he died. Wow. And mm. if I had just reached out, I hadn't been stubborn, and he hadn't been stubborn, and if, 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 all the fucking ifs. So, I think your show tonight, if it reaches even just one person, Dave, just one person who could reach out to somebody that they haven't spoken to in a while, and it might even be their dad. I don't know, I have a sister who's not talking to me right now, and I had a brother that we hadn't spoken for quite some time, but in the last year, he and I have reconnected, and it's just been the best thing that's happened to me in so long. And I can tell Mm -hmm. you that it's amazing. There are so so many reasons. Yeah, there are so many reasons we can become estranged. It can be religion. Lately, more than ever, it can be politics. That's what it it was. Yeah. Oh, it's so polarizing. There's so many things. it, it is. And it's just, again, sometimes you can't bridge the gap. I've tried with my daughter and she just won't. Yeah. And I just, I, yeah. I, you know, from my own mental health, I had to quit trying. I had to quit, you know, yeah. if you keep reaching your hand into the, into the, th- into the cage and then the yeah. lion bites it over and over again, at some point yeah. you just, <laughs> you're just stupid well, for keep, foolish. to keep yeah. doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. A lot of times it's not that it's not that clear cut. A lot of times there's yeah. just vagueness, there's just gray area, you know, we just we got mad at each other, yeah. we could talk and years went by. Yeah. And sometimes it just takes a phone call. It just takes somebody, one of the persons yeah. to reach across the yeah. aisle and say, Hey, let's just talk. Let's just figure this yeah. out. You know, I think and, when and it, religion's involved, it's yeah. yeah, yeah. With the with religion, religion will override that natural inclination to reconcile. You could have yeah. both parties yeah. Yeah. desperately wanting to reconcile, but one of them might yeah. be holding off because, well, I got to follow my God, and the other one might yeah. be saying, "Well, if yeah. I try, I'll be shunned even more." And yeah, it's it's yeah. it's yeah. it's such a it's such a toxic and unneeded complication to already you know, complicated human relationships. Um, yeah. yeah, it really is. Yeah, that's the case with it my really daughter. Is. She's she's following the mandate of God. Well, she, th- she says it's God. It's actually a, a pastor that she's connected with. But to yeah. her, it's the voice of God. Um, it's usually a man, a person. And with with the uh, with the religion that we're aware of, it's always almost always men uh, that, are, that yeah. are controlling things. I mean, let's just with be the, real. Yeah. With Jehovah's Witnesses, it's ten men in New York. It's a it's a committee, oh, yeah. a governing body, and they set the rules. And it's yeah, 
it's the it's, it's 10 guys 10 guys in new york city is acting as a wedge between so many relationships worldwide yeah. it's amazing it's, it's hideous it's hideous yeah, yeah. And, and, and please yeah. don't hear me saying anyone that you have to do this. I know there are many circumstances no. where, where it's really not, not healthy for you mentally to put yeah. yourself in a situation that you know is going to be, um, damaging emotionally or abusive or toxic. So please don't hear us saying that, but there are many occasions mm -hmm. where it can it can be now if not totally healed at least made better if someone just makes an in, effort in my situation if my dad had been there for me i could have gotten out of a i was in a really abusive marriage like really bad and if i'd had the the backing of my my dad i think it might have given me the strength i needed he yeah, he he you know? just couldn't support you in it. His his methodology was to abandon you in it and and it was, tell you yeah. I don't approve, and so I'm going to cut you off. That's just he yeah. didn't have your back. Yeah, you know? and it's, it's had sad. nothing to do with religion. And going back to religion, I think that a lot of people who cut people off for religion, what it is for them is it's just for them it's another sign of the times, right? It's like. Mm -hmm. When it's the when it's the religious one who says I'm not going to talk to you because you don't believe anymore, that's just confirmation for them that they're doing the right thing. Jesus yeah. is coming back because it's the great falling away and daughter and yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're just fulfilling what they see as biblical prophecy, and it's just a load of mm -hmm. crap. And it's just there's nothing you can do to fight against indoctrination. But anyway, well. It's I'm glad one of the glad reasons you're I tell everyone I love them that. every day. <laughs> yeah, at least you talked to William every day, and that was good. So you were you were invested in that relationship. So I'm sorry that you lost it so suddenly. And yeah. it's just a reminder that we we have to be aware that stuff can happen any day, and we just don't know. Um, we just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. thanks for calling, okay. Indy. Yeah, thank you guys, and good to see you guys. Okay, thank you. Have Dave. a good bye. show. Okay, bye. It's uh, one thing I sh one thing I should have mentioned at the beginning was uh, uh, so I'm actually I'm in my early 40s. I've been fairly fortunate in life. I have not experienced any major loss like what Dee was describing, mm -hmm. Dave. What I'm sure what you've gone through, um, but I know I will eventually. I mean, it's just a matter of time. Oh, yeah. um, I have a dad, oh, I have yeah. a dad that I love dearly. <laughs> I have many friends and I have, you know, people I care about deeply. And one day it's going to hit me and it's probably going to hit me like a truck. So hearing D, you know, talk about her experience, her loss, the thoughts going through her head, the regrets she has, the motivation she has, and also the joys that she had. Hey, maybe I did take advantage of this opportunity, like with her friend, William. Uh, I appreciate those insights because that helps me not only, you know, prepare myself for the inevitable, you know, suffering of loss, it's going to be in our future, but it helps me take advantage of the time I have now, tying back to our original discussion at the beginning. It, it helps you put into perspective, hey, you should probably go talk to somebody that you've been thinking about talking to, uh, or go find that person that, hey, I maybe mean, a lost friend that you haven't talked to in a while, and there is no problem mm -hmm. between you, but just just life got in the way. Um, yeah, yeah a lot of, of times that. it's that. You just drift, drift apart, and, and, uh, you don't think you get busy and you don't think and then a week becomes a month becomes a year becomes five years yeah, yeah. and then you read on facebook they died <laughs> i mean it's just that's just the nature of life so if this you know we have lines open we have a few to get to in a minute we'll get right there but if this is striking a chord with you if you've lost someone that you know has impacted you this way we'd love to hear from you 720-619-2288 is the number or the web link in the description or if there's someone that you feel like you should connect with and this is resonating with you give us a call talk about it we're here yeah. to to work those things through with you as best we can yeah. we are not therapists we're not trained in anything i don't know anything about anything and i want to say that right, <laughs> right out of the gate i'm as dumb as a rock but i'm here uh, to listen and talk and we will be there as much as we can
yeah, I, I'm just a fellow human. I have emotions. I have a couple ears, and I have some opinions that I can share if you want. And that's that's we're just here to talk. And it's pretty much it. Ideas. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a Morgan. Uh, hate to abruptly change the subject. A Morgan did uh, request that we remind everybody about super chats. Um, I'm not sure what the threshold is, or if we remount the, oh, the show. Yeah. But, Thank uh, you for that. Yeah. I was, I was amiss to not mention that. At the end of the show, um, Eric and I will read any super chat of five dollars or more. If you uh, want to get your questions or comment into that, then we would love to hear from you and um, chat with you that way. And it's a great way to support the show. Another great way to support the show and the and the channel and the line is Patreon. Um, that is patreon.com slash call the line. So there's two great ways to support the show with Patreon and Super Chats. And we'd love to hear from you. And let's take a call from Infidel, he, him, in Delaware. Hey, I guess your name is Dale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, I go by Infidel. Yeah, we're, uh, you're on the line with Dave and Eric. What can we do for you tonight? Hey, first of all, uh, when I say hi, family, I mean that. Um, I want to talk about two things. The main thing I called to talk about was finding community uh, in the secular community, finding more family friends after losing them uh, to religion, pseudoscience, things of that nature. Um, but after mm -hmm. hearing what I just heard, I'd, I'd like to mention that uh, I am currently or currently have and or I'm going through the loss of my mother while she's alive. Um, she is an evangelical Christian. I am a vocal atheist slash anti-theist. And mm -hmm. since, you know, a lot of people have the same stories, but from pandemic, there's been a lot of chaos and I've pretty much lost the majority of my friends and family, including my mother. But five or six months ago, my mother found out she had cancer. When she went to tell me she had cancer, uh, she had me come over to her house and showed me the paper, like from the doctor, and she like kind of waved it in the air. <laughs> Reminded me of like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, like finding the golden ticket. And she said, "I've got cancer." And I went, "But mom, it doesn't. We don't even have a full diagnosis yet. Like we don't have to, you know, worry yet. Like maybe it's not terminal. We can still hope that it'll be okay." And her reply, looking into my eyes, was, "Hope that it'll be okay. I'm praying that it's not." And everything mm. in me, like I'm an only child, mama's boy, like single mother, very close, our whole lives just dropped. Like she wants to go be with Jesus. And mm -hmm. otherwise, she's healthy and it's treatable. Um, it's not curable, but it's treatable. And from everything they've said, they could give her another 20 years, but she doesn't want even non invasive. So mm. To me, it's so the difference between her wanting to die and being okay with death. Which are two so, very so she is, she's outright refusing treatment is basically what you're saying because of all, her beliefs. All, yeah, all treatment, including, wow. uh, including uh, therapy that they were talking about. Hey, maybe we can get her on a page like mentally where she thinks about this a different mm -hmm. way. And it's hard for me as a non-believer to you know bring the religion into it, but that's it. The, the scariest part, and I'll say this because people need to hear it, but of my mother is I did not know uh, she felt this way until recently. She had um, wow. early term abortion a long time ago and mm -hmm. was fine with it my whole life growing up as our two family unit, you know, two person family unit. She used to say it was the best thing she ever did for us because she was going through a divorce with my father. So it was the right decision, you know, fiscally, financially for everybody and emotionally too. Now she thinks it's the worst decision she ever made. And she said this line, which to me made me think I was looking into the eyes of like a monster. It was honestly very scary. She said, Dale, I, I know you don't know this, but I have to go be with your sister. Mm. An early term abortion she had given sex to because the church she now belongs to made her have a burial for her unborn child that was when I say unborn child, I mean early term abortion that was 30 years before she joined the church. Wow. So everything in me is just being crushed by this. And she's in love with, like I heard earlier, she thinks she's in love with God. I think she's in love with a pastor who speaks very well and convinces her of a lot of things. So she's dying. And we've basically gone from 
mama's boy very close to We Can't Speak anymore, and I moved to be close to her a few years ago. I moved away five weeks ago because I couldn't be too close to her anymore, but I want to be close enough that I can help. And that's where we're at. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's kind of an example. That's an example of how a relationship can be toxic and harmful if you're not careful. Um, And again, that's the, the finger of religion inserting itself into what would be a normal family relationship. And it becomes so dysfunctional because, as you said, Dale, it's, you know, we, we, they like to say it's, it's what God says, but it's, it's almost always what a spiritual leader says. One of the toughest things that has happened between us is when I couldn't understand why we couldn't speak anymore. I mean, I felt it had to do with the religion, but with her, it was, no, of course it's not. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. There's something, but who knows? And with me, it was, I'm looking at this logically, rationally. I can tell what it is, and she just doesn't want to face it. But I eventually got this from her. Dale, I can't tell you how I feel. If you want to know how I feel, call my pastor. And to me, wow. like, all oh, the lights went off. Like, oh, you're somebody else. I don't care who they are. Another human knows how you feel better than you do. That's, that's mm-hmm. saying a lot about where your head is or is not. Um, but the scariest part of the end of that is I did call him because I, I wanted to hear somebody say something like why my mother couldn't talk to me anymore. And these yeah. actual exact words came out of his mouth. Dale, I know you're a smart guy. I'm not going to pretend to, you know, blow smoke, blah, blah, blah. You're very intelligent. But one of the reasons that your mother and you can't communicate is your mother is a woman. And women don't understand the way men speak. At that moment, I stopped him. I mean, I really did on the phone and said, Pastor, thank you for trying. I'm sorry. I know she wouldn't agree, but that was misogynistic as fuck. And I can't let somebody speak that way about my mother. So while my mother would probably tell me that I'm the bad person for not letting you speak that way about her, I refuse to. And I'm done. And I hung up the phone. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's just, I mean, but that's how she thinks. She thinks she's not smart enough to talk to me because she's a woman. And it's like that's been drilled into her by him. Not by a God. Now, were you raised in that kind of religion? I was raised in a reformed Judaism home. So Uh it was basically like we believe in a God, but there was no deep religion. Um, My family was Jewish. And to me, it was, I I look at it now as we were probably deists. There is a God, but who knows the rest. Right, right. And 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 how long has your mom been? I'm sorry, go ahead. How long has your mom been in that cult? I'll just call it that. Well, the, the problem, what happened with us is when I moved out of the ha- I moved out of the house at like 17 and a half, 18, like right when I could. Um, yeah. And at that point, she still was not religious. And this is going to okay. sound, you know, common, you'll get it. But when I started getting into a little trouble in my late teens, early 20s, she found Jesus because she needed some help to deal with her son who was partying a little too much. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I'm not taking blame for that. You know, unfortunately, she turned to a friend who said, I can help you. Maybe these questions you have will be answered. Come with me. And it happened to be to a church. So I missed all those years when I was out of the house. I was becoming a somewhat scientifically literate skeptic slash atheist, and she was becoming an evangelical Christian. I didn't really know mm-hmm. how deep it was until a few years ago. I just knew she believed, and I was okay with it because I thought it was like a surface belief. Mm-hmm. I, I found out she believed in demons when her pastor said, you, you may not be possessed by the devil. It may just be a demon or an evil spirit. And I like, how do you even like, I laugh at that. Like, oh, don't worry. It may just be an evil spirit. That's not a big deal. We can get them out. Like, what the f- These are real people living in our reality. But oh, yeah. Thinking they live in a separate reality. It's nuts. I used Not, to believe anyway. in demons and angels and all that, but um, so you've had to kind of distance yourself from your mom, but you're there if she needs her needs you is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because she's going to be dying. I mean, I, she is dying. <laughs> like, and, and Dave, mm. you know, it hits me so hard with what you're doing. She's doing the opposite. She's curling up in a ball and dying quietly. She doesn't want anybody to know. And, and to me, that yeah. says something about where your head's at, you know? Um, but, but so the end of this is, uh, and the reason I called is 
all of these things, and I've lost friends to QAnon, and it wasn't just that, a lot of pseudoscience. Hey, if you stick an amethyst up your butt, it'll cure COVID, you know, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. At this point, I've lost, give, I would say lost, intentionally given up because it got too difficult. Friends and family, because I want to be who I am. And watching the line, like I'm being serious, uh, it's only been somewhat recent for me. I've considered myself an atheist, anti-theist skeptic for a long time. But I've never been part of the interactive community until after last mm -hmm. election. When I did, I started doing spaces. I came to Twitter, shut all my old social media off and came to Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. And that's where it happened for me, where I said, wait a minute, all of my friends and family who have been giving me shit for years and telling me I'm evil for saying the things I am, they weren't the people who I should have been speaking to. Like now I'm speaking to people, algorithms, right? who care about the things I'm saying and kind of get my message and are willing to engage from the other side. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden I opened up these worlds to me where there are other people like me. Most of us are just quiet because we're scared to speak up. And to me, it's a big part of everything I do nowadays. I'm speaking you know, out loud to people, <laughs> speaking out loud, dying out loud, is it, we have to be willing to speak. It, it, the great, it's a very simple but great quote by the great Christopher Hitchens. There can be no progress without head-on confrontation. And if mm -hmm. we sit still, like we're in homeostasis, and it's fine and it feels nice, but there's no chance at progress. So my mother would just wanted to spin our wheels when we were falling apart. And I kept trying to interact, and she wouldn't, so we fell apart. So for me, it's just like amazing finding other people who are willing to have the conversation. If you can't discuss the ideas, you're never going to understand somebody. And if you don't understand someone, it's tough to get along. Yeah, I I'm think that's a, that's, a great, that, that's a great point there, too, that um, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, due to politics and also religion, you know, we are very polarized people. Um, you, United States especially, but especially right now with the political realm, it is very us versus them, very, you yeah. know, um, uh, if you're on that side, I can't talk to you or we're, our yeah, friendship is somehow diminished. Again. Our friendship is somehow diminished because we have different political opinions. Um, and yeah, we we if we give into that and we say to ourselves oh hey you know this person is of course like i said caveat um if the person's toxic and brings you pain and, and suffering in your life it's okay to cut that person out for your own mental health and everything but you have to ask yourself that question whether that's the case or not but you might be surprised that hey somebody might be fine with a friendship and because you have different opinions that's not going to get in the way of it. Um, so it's important for us to not allow those things to get in our way of reaching out to people, at least trying, at least, you know, one day down the road, we can yeah. say, I at least tried to talk to this person, or I at least tried to mm -hmm. mend the bridge. Um, again, like I said, with the caveat of it's, it's up to everybody to make that decision about different individuals. Um, but we want to avoid that pitfall of, of this person thinks differently than I do. Therefore, I got to cut myself off from that person like it is, in many cases that won't make sense and it, and it shouldn't because we are different people we have different opinions we're going to have different values and different outlooks and uh accepting that and embracing it and not letting that get in the way of normal human relationships i think is really important mm -hmm. yeah it's, it can be a fine line to to dance on i know that and it can be difficult yeah. like like dale when you're trying to talk with your mom and she's just talking nonsense and can't talk to you because she's a woman and won't won't look for medical help where it's available um those are areas that it's just almost hard to have a conversation around because you're you're not even speaking the same language almost and so i know that's a I difficult all, I say, yeah i say all I, the time dave um i say all the time that uh, i speak to people all the time who speak english which is what i speak and we speak very different languages. I'm yeah. with you. I understand what you're saying, and I get that. My mother and I don't speak the same language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a family of my brothers and sister and mom. They're all conservative evangelicals, and that's the water they swim in, and I swim in this water. So we don't pass each other in the water much because we're yeah. in different rivers. Yeah. Um, yeah. But still the line of communication is open and as much as lies within me i'm going to keep it open um we don't talk often because there's just really not much to talk about if if it gets other than you know 
piddling stuff, uh, the kids and the weather and whatever. But I'm going to keep it open. I'm going to ma- make sure that those lines of communication are never blocked by me. Um, well, my so I'm, my relationship. Sorry, Dave. Go ahead. That's okay. Go ahead. I was, I was done. Yeah, no, I was jumping in. But my relationship with her really did fade quickly when she first said, let's just not talk about religion. And then it was now religion and politics. And then it literally got to just keep your feelings inside if I hurt your feelings because there's nothing I can say to help. <laughs> yeah. so it was a drastic yeah. you know, fall in about a year, that year and a half. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds like you're doing all you can there. And I'm glad you've gotten on the internet and you know, for, for all the internet is, uh, the pain in the ass that it is, it can often be a channel, a conduit for us to find one another. And for, th- for that, I'm thankful. So I'm glad you found that. It's, it's a tool and like all tools, it's how we use it. And I have found a way, like I said, when I came here to use it to communicate with people who think similarly to the way I do to build a stronger community. And it's not building, and this is a side note too, but it's not building an insular community like religions do. Right. It's building a community of people I can talk to. And, and I want people who are religious to be part of my community. My community is free thinkers. You can be religious, depending on the definition, and be a free thinker. You just have to be open to the conversation. And when people mm-hmm. aren't, that's when I'm not capable of you know, trying. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what, where I live too. Well, man, I appreciate the call. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Call back anytime. Thank you, and uh, you bet, <laughs> sharing your pain and help. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. All right, take Thanks care. Dale. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Dale. Dale's, uh, Dale's story about his mother uh, reminds me of somebody that uh, I'm close to. Uh, this individual is still a Jehovah's Witness. Um, he has spent his entire life in service to this religion, given up, dropped out of high school early, given up opportunities for careers and jobs and homes and stability, uh, virtually has nothing to his name when it comes to like finances, because he's living day by day. Mm-hmm. He thinks Armageddon's going to strike literally any day now. Yeah. Any day. And there's no, no need to save up for the future. And I was talking to him a few years ago and, uh, he made a really interesting comment that, that Dale's mother's comment reminded me of, he said to me, that he doesn't expect to live more than 10 more years. At this Mm -hmm. point, he was in his early 50s. And he's, I was like, why do you say that? And he was talking about some health issues and some other things. And, but he has no real solid indication that his lifespan is limited to 10 more years. And it got me to thinking and speculating, why would he say something like that? Um, And pure speculation, but I think that he doesn't want to deal with the consequences of the life he lived. And I'm like I said, speculation, Mm -hmm. I can't read minds, but if I were in his shoes and I was looking back on my life and thinking to myself, I I have no preparations for retirement. I'm going to be working until the day I die. Do I really want to deal with that? Do I really want to do that? Right. Hey, right. I have my religion. Death is a get out of jail free card. If I die, I will be with according to the witnesses instantly resurrected in a paradise earth in the future from his perspective. And it, mm-hmm. I think this type of religious think, it really skews your ability to, well, one, plan for the future, uh, which is kind of unrelated, but also to cope with your mistakes and take the time that you do have left to start correcting them. Um, 50 years old, it's up there, but it's not that up there. You can U-turn you your life. You can start building yeah. a career. You can start saving for that retirement. You have time to do that. Um, well, and yeah, I think it's and just... His uh, that, that, and it's, it's an escape clause. It's an escape clause. Yeah. And uh, it also is the reason they don't care about the planet or anything having to yep. do with future yep. preparation. God's going to come take all this away. Exactly. Yep. No politics, no environmentalism, Easy no peasy. saving, no college. Yeah, it's just a, it just completely sabotages your future prospects and, and steals them from you. Keeps you that keeps you eternally dependent on the faith because you need that faith, you need that hope, or else it was all for nothing. Um, oh yeah, and yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I guess the moral of my story there is that um, it, it's, it, I don't think it's ever too late to make a U-turn and, and start trying something, start gaining back something that you've lost to your religion. Um, you can be 70 years old and you can start doing oh, new things, I trying new things. Go, yeah. You can always like, take advantage of that. start rewriting your story. 
you know, if you don't yeah. like the way your story's going, rewrite it. Yeah. You can always do don't, that. I agree 100%. Don't th- let's don't don't throw in the towel. Use your energy. Let's talk Use your time. to yeah. Andrew. Andrew, he, him in Florida. How you doing, Andrew? Hello, gentlemen. Good evening. Hey there. Andrew. You're talking with Dave and Eric. He says there that religion slash God enhances your ability to love and makes you fully human. Tell us about yes, that. Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, speaking of throwing in the towel, um, um, as Eric mentioned, I, I want to um, speak about throwing, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Because what you gentlemen are highlighting tonight, um, I think fairly, it are the negative aspects of religion. But I, I think we're overlooking the, the positive aspects. Um, I've been able to love and develop deep bonds because of religion. It's enhanced my marriage. It's enhanced my relationship with my children. Um, religion has given me the framework to, to develop deeper bonds, and, and it gives us principles and values that enhances um, our humanity, our, 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 the way that we are, our, our interact as humans. It gives us a culture um, and themes like forgiveness, redemption, love, and the indissolubility of marriage, where marriage is forever. It makes our marriage truly meaningful because of, because of the religion. Well, what if I told you I love and forgive and can do all of those things without religion? So. How is my experience not valid and yours valid? It's valid. You know, you can um, you can take a car to the airport or you can take an Uber. They're both valid, but um, one of them is, I think, is just a better tool to navigate this life. The other is a tool as well. Uber is a pretty good tool for um, for many people, but I think driving a car is a better tool for most people. We well, have to pay for parking, though. That's a good point. You got to pay for parking. Got that o- awkward silence Thank with you. the driver. Although some of us like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't see Andrew, that you've, I mean, uh, you're not explaining anything that religion does bring. You're just saying it's like a blanket that you put over life and it makes everything warm and cozy. I, I contend that I love more fully as an atheist than I did as a Christian. For one reason, if if not only this, if this wasn't the only reason, it'd be enough. I don't put people in categories of good and bad, saved and lost, evil or holy. Um, I don't judge LGBTQ people as people who are sinners. I don't have any any category of person that I deem more valuable or redeemed or holy or right or correct than another we're all human and i love every human the same and when i was in christianity i didn't because i saw people as sinners in need of a savior and i saw people in different lifestyles as those who weren't living as correct and holy as i was uh andrew yeah uh, uh, got a question Got a question for you, Andrew. Um, so, uh, how long have you been religious? Sixteen years. Sixteen years. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, some of these claims that you made that your religion uh, religion allows you to form deeper bonds, uh, it brings you and your wife together in a deeper way. Uh, the eternity of your union and marriage makes it better. Uh, those are pretty lofty claims. How have you compared that with? a non-religious union, non-religious marriage. Have you ever been married non-religiously? No. Okay. That's hard to do. So so from my, so let me just cap this off and let you talk. You're sitting here telling us the advantages of an Uber over a taxi when you've never driven a taxi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, so my question, I, I guess my question would be, I'm sorry, I, I did say I'll let you talk. I'll hold my question. Go ahead. Go ahead and give me your, your retort. No, no, finish, finish. So I can get process fully, you know, everything you, you're trying to say. Right. Um, so you currently don't have a point of reference when comparing one to the other, which is okay. I mean, I don't have a point of reference of being married religiously. I've always been married non-religiously, so I can't make, I can't make the argument that, hey, non-religious marriage is better. I can't make that argument. I don't think I ever would. Um, 
But I guess the question is, how can we determine which is better if either are better? And whether other factors might be involved that might say, uh, be unrelated or, or closely related to the religion, but not dependent on the religion. For instance, if you and your wife are aligned in the same religion, you have the same goals, the same values, it's going to enhance your relationship. That's not dependent on the religion, that's just being aligned in certain goals. Like if my wife and I, we aren't, but let's say my wife and I are really into uh, feeding the hungry in Africa. Like we both go to Africa, we're there, we're doing work, we're making meals, and we, we meet each other there and we're both doing these things together. We're gonna have a deeper relationship than a couple that doesn't, I would think or at least myself with my wife, if we weren't doing that together. So I guess mm -hmm. my question is, why is religion necessary for this? Why isn't it just the common goals, common values, and, and working together as a team towards those values that enhances a relationship? I think those three criteria that you mentioned, those are good criteria. I think those criteria are better manifested because of religion in, in many different ways. And, and one example, I think will be marriage. If you look at the statistics in the secular Western world of the, the marriage of secular people, uh, the, the secular marriage versus religious marriage, religious marriages are less likely to get divorced. They're more likely to stay longer because of the commitment with the ceremony and the doctrines and the beliefs. And if you marry someone- 50% of Christian marriages end in divorce, the same as secular. Right. I don't know where you, right. get, those are, where you get your stats. Those, those are secular Christians living in a secular society who grew up in public school, who don't attend Secular church. Christians? So they're not yeah, real they're Christians. Very, they're very, they're I didn't not say real they Christians. Real Christians. I said they're heavily influenced by secularism. Um, you don't know that. So, you don't know that. Yeah. You're painting you know, a very broad brush here. Of those marriages? You don't know those, those marriages? You don't know those couples? 80% 80, 80 um, of, of the, the, the majority of, of people growing up in America are educated through the public school system. And so they, that, they don't have a Christian. That has nothing to do have... with whether they're a Christian. That has nothing to do with Christian marriages. You said Christian marriages are less likely to end in divorce. Statistics do not bear that out. I'm sorry, you're wrong. Right. If you look deeply into the statistics and you compare people who are devout, going to church, who had a Catholic wedding, who did so not sleep together more before Christian. getting married, the more Christian, show you you're saying they have to be more devout, and you're the devout. arbiter. You're the one that decides which ones are devout and which ones aren't. I'm giving very general criteria to show that they're devout. Yes, they you are. They didn't sleep together before marriage. They attend church on a weekly basis. Um, they, they got married within the church. They didn't just get married civilly. The criteria like that, you will see lower divorce rates because you, when, when you look at statistics, you can't look at generalities. You have to look at very specific um, cases. You have to look at- um, Is divorce always bad? Is divorce always bad? If it saves you from a bad situation, it, is, it, it, is, it can be a positive outcome. But on the whole, separating children then why from their do parents. You, why are you? Why are you? You're. I mean, you don't. You're assuming all these marriages have children. You're assuming a lot of things, Andrew. Just a lot I of told, things, and you're painting I with a you, very, very broad brush. Pardon, Andrew. I can tell you, Andrew. I can tell you that that um, my parents stayed together because of the religion, and I was one of two children in that. And looking back, I think they should have divorced when I was younger. I think it would have been much better. For the family as a whole yeah a lot of people Here's, leaving religion say that but a lot of people whose parents did no say I, I said that even before i left my religion see you're, the you're painting with the broad brush you came you came on andrew <clears throat> you came on with a very broad statement that god and religion makes all of life better loving and marriage and forgiveness and all the things in life are better because of god and that's just not true because we can see statistically and in the world we live in we see that that's not true and what you do now when we when we counter that broad brush stroke that you made is you start trying to dive deeper and trying to build categories of christians and you're claiming that only the, the devout ones is what i'm talking about and you're the one who gets to decide who's devout and who's not who made you the judge of that? 
I'm not saying I'm the judge. I gave very general criteria for someone who practices the religion and applies the principles that, that I've laid out. The principles that will um, prevent fighting, that will prevent abuse and toxicity. Um, Christian principles such as love, um, love your wife as yourself. Um, Christian principles such as forgiveness and redemption. Pr Christian principles. Love is as, not a Christian principle. Forgiveness is not a Christian principle. In fact, secular people are able to forgive without a blood sacrifice, which your God was not able to do. You're acting I don't like Christianity need to sacrifice. Owns... Yeah, you're acting it like Christianity it, it, owns these these terms. It, I don't need to go like... sacrifice an animal or a child in order to forgive someone. If I was God and wanted to forgive humanity, I would just fucking forgive them. I don't need for somebody to die. That's messed up, Andrew. That's not love, and it's not forgiveness. So these terms that you claim to own are not what you say they are. It seems you're taking everything good of the religion and you're saying it's not really the religion because we see it outside of religion and you're only looking at the toxic elements. I mean, we can do that with anything. We can look at the toxic no, elements. No, I'm looking Andrew. at love. Well, I don't Andrew, need I, I God just, no, to love someone. Andrew, let's clarify. I'm, I'm going to clarify our position here. We are not claiming the opposite of what you're claiming. You're saying that religion makes marriages better. And I'm not saying that not religion makes marriage better. I'm saying no. I don't have the data to accept your claim. I'm not stating the opposite is true. No, I'm not saying, yeah, I don't think I said that, that you're claiming the opposite. I'm, I'm, I, what my I, claim, I think I said. Well, my, my claim is that it's unnecessary. You can have a mm -hmm. deep relationship with a person without religion. That's the point. Now, how you measure here. which, how you measure which relationships are deeper than others. I have no idea how you do that, and I don't think you have an idea either. I think you're looking mm -hmm. at the data in a very biased way. For example, you said earlier that those that are religious, devoutly religious, are less likely to get divorced. Well, yeah, if you're devoutly religious, and one of the rules of the religion is don't get divorced you're gonna get divorced less. That doesn't mean you have a deeper relationship. That doesn't mean you have a better relationship. That doesn't mean you're happier. You could be piss poor, miserable in your relationship and still keep it because the religion dictates it to you. That sounds like personal hell to me. I'm glad I don't experience that. But you're, you're, you're pointing at this, 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 this observation that religious folks get divorced less than others, which I don't accept. But let's just say for a moment it's true. Yeah, the religion dictates that. How does that make it better? <clears throat> you're, you're. It's not just that they. It's not just that they don't get a divorce. They report higher marital satisfaction compared okay. to less. Okay. Religious, so they're more satisfied with their marriage, not just the sex, but overall in everything because of all of the positive attributes of religion and and. And, and saying that oh all the, it, it's only the negative aspects. It's because of religion, but. All the good stuff, it's not because of the religion. That sounds like a bias to me. You're, you're just throwing out everything good about religion. I'm not, you're missing, I'm not no, making you're claims. You're missing what Andrew said. You're missing what Andrew said. We're saying it's not necessary. I'm Eric. You're, you're making a claim. Uh, I'm sorry, Eric. Uh, okay. Andrew, I was looking at the screen. It's okay. You're making a claim I'll, that you I'll can't support with evidence. It's all, it's anecdotal. It's anecdotal. Again. You can't support this with evidence. And again, Andrew. Andrew, I'm, like I said, I'm not saying what you're saying is false. I'm saying you can't demonstrate it to be true. Therefore, I don't accept it. And my counter to what you just said about how uh, these people are self-reporting, we have better sex, we have better relationships, we're happier overall. I come from the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a group that is so concerned about their public reputation that they cover up rampant uh, uh, child abuse. sex abuse in their church. Okay, because it's better to hide facts and present a good forward-looking face than it is to deal with internal problems. So in an, in an organization like that, where people are following the rules of, hey, don't get divorced, also Jehovah's name and his reputation are paramount, so you better act that way. What do you think that's gonna do for self-reporting on the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the happiness and your sex life in a marriage if those people were to, to report on that?
Don't you think that might skew their results? That might skew their responses? Your data could be skewed and you don't even, you aren't even considering these things. Right. The, the studies I've seen are self-reported and they were from a secular institution. The Institute for Family okay. Studies. They weren't reported the secular by institution. The, the secular these institution not is not going to, the secular institution doesn't have anything to do with how the people are reporting and their motivations for reporting. If a person is reporting for the survey, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, and in their brain they go, I better represent my religion really well. Yes, our sex is great. Yes, I'm very happy. Yes, we never have any problems. Don't you think that might happen? It seems and I'm like not saying that this is I'm not saying this is evidence that you're wrong. I'm saying that these are right. problems in your presentation and why I can't accept that you're right. I understand. I understand. You're not saying the opposite. Okay. You're just saying it's definitive. All right. Um, right. It, it, and so whatever data I show I, I show us, we're, we're, it, it seems like we're just going to um, say it's not definitive. It's not going to be enough. So there's really no way to look at the positive aspects of religion and say and, and, and just give them credit where credit is due, because we're always going to just say, OK, the data is not definitive. And oh, we I will can do it without. Religion. So it's I kind will of gladly say right, that there are positive. I'll gladly say that there's positive aspects about religion and there are couples in religion, their religion will enhance their marriage. I will not go as far as to say that these marriages are enhanced beyond anything capable of those who are not religious or those who are secular. And that was your claim at the beginning of the call. And let's, let's, let's get off of marriage for a minute. That's just one thing you mentioned. You talked about love, forgiveness, kindness, hum, hum, good human qualities. You painted that with a broad brush too. Let's forget about marriage because shock not everyone's married so let's talk to them too you know the, the whole world is not just made up of happy married couples let's get real and your claim is that you you can bet life is better because of god how do you support that claim how do people love better and forgive better and be more kind and be more empathetic because of god give us the evidence for that It, it provides moral and ethical frameworks, community and fellowship, um, spiritual growth and personal transformation. It gives you purpose and spiritual meaning. Spiritual growth, you're, you're, that's, a, that's a religious buzzword. What the fuck does that mean? If you're not religious, you don't need spiritual growth. You're just throwing out Christian terms and saying you've got a monopoly on them. And I'm saying you don't. You're saying there's no evidence to support that people who are religious, in fact, the evidence might go the other way. There's a lot of meanness out there in the name of God. There's a lot of, and you'll just say, well, those are the mean Christians. They're not devout ones. All, I'm, all Eric and I are saying is that you're making claims that you cannot support with evidence. And on this I show, think, we need evidence. I, I, I gave us statistics and we, 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 we kind of just said they're not definitive. So I can give you one more anecdote to try to, and, um, if I may, because uh, we don't- Anecdotes we don't are have not evidence. Yeah. Anecdotes are not evidence, and statistics okay, well, on marriage is not what we're talking about now. Give us so statistics on people who love better. If I give you give statistics, us evidence just that say, God so not helps us be better people. If I give us statistics, I say it's not because of Christianity. Uh, you have to look at uh, the, you can love without it, and so it, it's not really going to be a fair conversation. Um, all, all, I, all I, my, my, my last point that I want to say is I did prison ministry for five years. And within those five years, I provided those men with religion, a weekly Bible study, and they en it enhanced their lives. They, they transformed in a, on a very deep and personal level. They felt forgiveness. They felt love. They felt a sense of wholeness that they've never felt in years. Um, men who are about to be put to death, um, it, it, it was found great comfort. Of course, because, because you gave them an answer. Of course they did in prison. That is not a representation of population at large. And you cannot use that as evidence as God helping us love better. My God, you know better results, than that, Andrew. I've talked to you results before. Results is evidence. Results is evidence. I've talked to you before. No, no, no. Not someone in prison. Results? Results is evidence enough for me. Well, it's enough for you, but it's not enough for us. Thank you for calling. Thanks, Colin, Andrew. Well, good evening, John. I've talked to this guy before. It's first time for me. Same old bullshit.
Yeah, same old bullshit. I, I think I have. He, when he mentioned the prison ministry, it sounded familiar. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna tell me a guy in prison's not gonna say yes to Jesus? Come on. Yeah. We saw Ted Bundy do that. I mean, come on. Of course they are. Yeah. I I would love to see the statistics, like real statistics. It's probably impossible to to figure out an accurate number about how many people accept Jesus and become Christian, just because it might increase their chances for parole by a few percentage points. Like, oh hell you, you yes, can't, you can't just dismiss those things. And and I know Andrew's not here anymore to to defend himself, but Andrew, I, I really recommend you 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 do not make such grand claims like religion is giving people something that cannot be achieved otherwise. Um, I think that was mm. really good question. I forgot exactly who coined it a long time ago. I think it might've been Christopher Hitchens, but just name one thing that religion exclusively gives to people <laughs> that, that non-religion can't. Something tangible, something real, heaven. something actually does something for you. Yeah, yeah tangible heaven. and real, it's kind of a condition you put on there. <laughs> it gives you, yeah, but it, but it gives you, I mean, that's, that's, that's ultimately hope. And other things can give you hope. You know, you can have hope for a better life. You have hope for, for well, meeting your friends. Well, the problem is it's a false things hope. That, it's, yeah, it's, it's a false, a false hope. hope that can't, you can never measure it. You can never say, well, yeah, I heard back from Bob and he said heaven's pretty great. So, see, we don't have that and we'll never have that. Yeah. So it's just a bunch of noise. Yeah. Uh, let's talk to Janice, he, him in Tennessee. How you doing, Janice? You're on the line with uh, Dave and Eric. Did I say it named right, Janice? Hello, Janice. Are you on the line? Janice. Hello, Janice. Are you there? I don't guess we have Janice. I hear chiming. Hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? There you go. Hey, Janice. Thank you. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Sorry, I was talking. What's I accidentally on? put you on mute uh, a few minutes ago. That's okay. What's on so, your mind? So, um, there's a lot here, and I know you all started this conversation by saying, or the show kind of by saying you're not therapists, and I realize I need probably a boatload worth of uh, therapy to fully work through all this, but I'm kind of just looking for general guidance as I'm at this stage of my life. Um, sure. My father had a stroke about two months ago now, and uh, I was living in Florida at the time. He called me basically preparing to beg me to move back to Tennessee to help take care of him. Um, wasn't overly enthusiastic about the idea. I left Tennessee in part to get away from him. It wasn't just him, but for me, that was a big part of it. And I had been let go earlier in the year, so I was unemployed, and he basically threw money at me and said, hey, I'll pay for you to move up here. Mm. Long story short, my father, and I'm not trying to be overly – picky with psychology terminology, but there's a very good probability he has narcissistic personality disorder. Certainly he acts a narcissist, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I can, without trying to keep this somewhat surface level, you know, there were a lot of things, especially in my childhood, that I look back at now, and especially as a parent myself, I'm like, yeah, you're a piece of crap that you did those things to me. And, and there were things mm -hmm. like... Um, a great example I tell is um, when my bro my nephew at one point went to my brother and said, hey, I don't want to play soccer anymore. And my brother's like, okay, what do you want to play instead? Well, my experience to prior to that was when I went to my dad and said, hey, I don't want to play soccer anymore. He said, oh, you're going to miss it. I'm going to sign you up anyway. And I, I realize that sounds like a very superficial, not big deal. It's a part of the overall story. And the way both my mm -hmm. mother and myself and my brother have always treated my father is we let him live in his delusional little world. We try to minimize his outbursts when he's in restaurants that cause him to blow up at people. And we just try to keep his negativity and toxicity to a minimum. Well, I have an amazing wife who has taught me this thing called having a backbone and learning to speak your mind. And my father despises it because he's mm. never had anyone check his attitude before. And mm -hmm. so before I even said I was willing to move up here, I said, you're going to learn how to, number one, apologize, because in his head, he never needs to apologize. He's never done anything wrong. And 
even if he's the one who's upset somebody, well, y'all should just get over it and move on. That's his philosophy. And so a couple of weeks ago, and, and this was literally the day my family moved up here because I kept them in Florida for about an extra month, um, things started basically falling apart at this place we rented. So I called to have my brother come over because he flew in from Scotland to help with my dad's health as well. And he came over. My dad shows up at the house. What's going on? My response was, it's all going to shit. I don't want to hear that, was his reaction, which is always his outburst kind of reaction. And I said, all right, well, thanks for coming. And I walked off. He immediately tried to start treating me like I was a six-year-old kid. Come back yeah. here. I kept walking. Come back here now kept walking off last time come back here now or else so i stopped i spun on my heels and i said i'm not a six-year-old child that you can make dictates to i'm an adult you have the right to ask me my permission to come to you and if i'm in a frame of mind in which i am capable i will turned off and walked off screams you're cut off i'm never going to have anything to do with you ever again because i'm sitting here like i just relocated my family to take care of your dying ass Shut up. So that's well, yeah. what and what's the uh, what's the net what's the net result here? You said he had a stroke. Is he in? He doesn't sound like he's incapacitated. And I guess he's you not, were in the you're somewhere right, here in the, in the call in the call screen that says, "Is it okay to be a jerk to an ailing parent who was slash is a jerk to me?" So. You're yep. kind of trying to work so through how question, do I treat him? Yeah, really my question is, he is a jerk. He's been toxic to everyone my whole life. Um, in his world, in his head, he thinks everybody in the world loves him and everyone goes out of the way to help him. And he has a very self-centered, delusional attitude. Uh, mm -hmm. He had lots of problems with me as a kid because, to quote him, I argued with him about everything. Um, which me as a parent, I'm like, if my child and I are having communication difficulty, it's my fault as the parent that I'm not communicating right. with my kid. It's not my kid's fault. And so are you so going to be living says, in the same, are you going to be living with him? Give me, give me, give us a no, view of what's going that. on there. So you're living yeah, near so, him or um, what? I refuse to live with him. I, I'm about seven miles from his house. Um, my okay. plan is to once my brother leaves, to basically take care of basic, not ADL things, he does have activities of daily living that he isn't able to do anymore, um, but, you know, drive him to the doctor, make sure the mail gets brought in, trash gets taken down, pay the bills, basic, you know, be as good of a person as I can be without committing my yeah. family Suff to him. So suffering is abuse. So where this so really comes I guess... And I guess so my I'm, gonna, I'm just trying is, to... In my head... Yeah, go ahead. In my head, and I was... Um, last week, had I actually gotten in and called you last week, I was incredibly angry last week. And when the anger is really strong, the anger, the resentment, all the things of, you know, from my childhood, it's really easy for me to lash out at him. So there's yeah. a part of me that's like, okay, I already have tons of self-hate and self-loathing and other things like that that I'm working through. So there's this part of me that says, okay, it's time to treat him the way he truly deserves to be treated. It is time for this aging man to be told that he is the piece of shit that he really is. Mm -hmm. But then the other but part I of me that says... The, the question is, what's that going to get you, get right? Well, part of it's mm -hmm. what's it going to get me. The other side of it is, you know, on one side I say to myself, okay, I already have tons of self-loathing for things I've done and things I haven't done in my life. Um, so tacking on putting this jackass in his place probably isn't going to darken my quote soul. If you want to use that terminology uh, any more mm -hmm. than it already is. The other side of me though, is I also don't want to hit 65 if I'm fortunate enough to make it there and go, yeah, that jackass shit I did on my dad's way to his grave. Nah, might not have been the best thing I do and end up having lots of remorse and guilt for it. The same way I did for things when I was a child that I didn't know better about. And I don't know how to balance this because I know his personality. I know that he will gaslight me. I know that he will mm -hmm. nitpick at me. And I know that he will use any opportunity, 
where I don't toe the line of what he thinks should be as opportunity against me. He ended up getting COVID. He immediately blamed me for it. I was like, I've not well, even been sick. Let me cut in here. Let me cut in here. Let's let's talk a little bit yes, about please. it. Again, we're not we're not therapists, and I do think I you need to, to have some therapy to work through this to talk through this complicated yes. issue. Um, I'll say a couple of things that I want to hear from Eric, but I don't know if you're going to be able to draw boundaries with him that he will respect. And you, I think if it were me, I would have to have a game plan for what to do if I draw boundaries that he tramples all over. What What is my response to that? Otherwise, it's going to be sounds to me like a, a lot of yelling back and forth, which is doesn't sound like it's going to be constructive to anyone. I want to hear your thoughts, Eric. Yeah. Um, and Yanis, uh, uh, I I know this is not what you meant by your question, but I'm being a little pedantic with it. Your question verbatim is, is it, okay, is it okay to be a jerk to an ailing parent who was a jerk to me? And since you're using the word jerk for both your behavior and his behavior, I know you don't mean it that way. I don't. I know you don't want to. I well, rather, I, I don't think you meant it this way. That you don't want to give him tit for tat, one for one treatment. What he's done to you, you're going to do right back to him. Um, I don't think you're the type of person who would gaslight someone, for example, or say physically abuse them if you were physically abused. Oh, no. So there, there's going to be a difference in your response to his abuses towards you. And the question I think you need to ask yourself is, which you mentioned it earlier, how are you going to feel one day down the road once he's gone, once that anger and that that constant aggravation, irritation, that constant toxicity has ceased. How are you going to look back and feel? I think is one thing. I think another one too is um, the way we behave can tend to become ingrained. And if we allow ourselves certain indulgences like, you know, uh, uh, violence or even other things like, you know, uh, uh, responding to things with like alcohol or responding to things with drugs or other, you know, generally negative right. things, it can tend to stick with with us. And then once he's gone, now you're going to be carrying this baggage with you going forward. And that might spill over on how you treat others or how your life goes. So you want to kind of be on guard with, okay, how am I behaving now? Is this something I want to carry with me as I keep on going? Because you will carry remnants with you as this ordeal ends and you move on with the rest of your life. You want to be careful to make sure that you aren't going to accidentally like taint your life down the road with things you might acquire mm -hmm. today. Um, I'm not a therapist. You, you might, completely handle that appropriately and move on without a scratch on you. Um, it, it, it's really the situation. Well, and yeah, this is question. probably something. Yeah. Um, th this is something that I think needs to be deeply discussed with you and your family. Um, not necessarily with your dad, but with like your, your more immediate family, anybody who's around on like, what, how have you coped with it? How are you been dealing with this while I've been away and such? Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, things like therapy, talking with friends. Can help. Yeah. Um, I have a similar Sorry. situation. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. But I have a very similar situation with my, mo my mother. Um, she's senile. Her mind is gone. There's zero chance of reconciliation at this point. But I hold on to a lot of anger from a lot of the crap that she put me and my family through when I was young. And I do notice, and the reason why I mentioned it earlier, I do notice that there are certain behaviors that I picked up in my direct dealings with her that I still carry over now. And those are things like, I don't like these characteristics of me that I might have taken out of there. So that's kind of one of the reasons why I mentioned that, because I have firsthand experience of that, of, hey, I'm going to be as much of a jerk to this person as this person was to me. And then now it's, you hold on to that as you keep on going and you can, you can kind of leak through in your behaviors with other people. And it's something you got to be on guard against. Um, and it's very difficult because if you, if your father truly is a narcissist or he just is simply just unyielding and unbendable, you may be just bashing your head against a brick wall when it comes to, to mm -hmm. dealing with him or trying to correct him. And you, you got to find, you got to, if that is the case and you, that's your conclusion, then you got to come to terms with that and figure out how to either cope or avoid it. Um, and uh, that's only something that you can evaluate and you can figure I, out for yourself. Yeah. You, that's you, fair. you are avoiding has been my primary method for the past yeah. five to 10 years. It's well, actually yeah. for most of my life, my, my solution has always been to, if I can't de-escalate it, walk away. And then I move yeah. states to get away from him. Yeah. Uh, and my wife out. actually looked you... at me when I... Sorry. Uh -huh. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I interrupted. Um, go ahead. 
No, no, you're fine. Um, and, and that was one of the things my wife pointed out when we started talking about coming back. It's like, you you promised me that, that we wouldn't go back because we know how he is. And it's kind of like I allowed my vulnerability of being unemployed um, to sway my judgment. And I swear it wasn't 24 hours before the very toxicity that I ran away from resurfaced. Yeah, yeah you're reopening that old wound. Well, that, yeah. yeah, that's going to be there. And I think... For me, I would I would be measuring the cost benefit of this. I know you want to help him, uh, but if you don't have good boundaries, I feel obligated to help him. I feel obligated yeah. more out of a sense of duty to my mother and my grandparents. I could care less about him. Yeah, or um, care less. Yeah, I understand. Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's a lot of anger already in you around the situation and toward him. And I'm just concerned yeah, personally yeah, that, that that's going to be stirred up on a regular basis as you try to help him with ADL and interact with him on a regular basis. That's going to, unless he's able, which I don't think he's going to be, uh, to respect your boundaries and to listen to what you say um if you guys can establish some ground rules and work on a daily basis together then it can work i don't know that you can based on what you're saying and i don't know what your plan b is um i oh, really think you got to be again. talking through yeah you got to be talking through some this stuff with a therapist um because it's just going to it's going to yank your chain a lot probably yeah and i i was somewhat prepared for that and you know after he got really upset after i told him no um after he you know the the incident i explained a moment ago he called me and asked how do we fix this i said well it starts by you apologizing you did something wrong so you apologize well, i didn't do anything wrong you still say i'm sorry because you affected other people's day with your attitude. I didn't do anything wrong. So even in my attempt to teach basic humanity, mm -hmm. uh, and that just makes me want to go ahead and just say, I'm quitting the job I just got and packing my family back up and we're out of here. Um, I can't do mm -hmm. that because I can't let my, you know, I have to have a job, but right. I, I just, I, I basically I was ready after that. I was ready to pack to, to unpack or, repack the u-haul and move again since we barely had finished unpacking <laughs> um yeah and i don't know what to do and it's like again i have the sense of duty not mm -hmm. for him i could care less it's related to my mother and her family they were the good people in my life you know her father is the person who taught me what it means to be a good man um, my yeah. father is who taught me what it was to be a bad man. And then I've tried my entire life to be the antithesis of what you want. Um, and so I do these things out of the goodness that came from the good parts of my family, but I'm worried that his toxicity is going to ruin or negatively impact my life. And yeah. I'm kind of like, you know, my brother moved to California to get away from him and only came because, to quote my brother, I only showed up because I knew if I didn't, you and he would have killed each other. Not That's literally, not but he was basically saying he knew that our two personalities would clash because I don't tolerate a bully, and my dad's a bully, and mm -hmm. he knew that it was going to blow up. It, sure enough, 24 hours in, it blew up. And that's just where yeah, I, I'm kind of like... I don't know. I don't know that there's much of a future there based on what you're saying, unless you guys can get a mediator or somebody to kind of work with you together uh, so that you can help him. And if he's not able to do that, I don't know what kind of future you've got there. That's just me off the top. Here. I don't, I don't have the experience or the training to speak yeah. any further to it. And, uh, my my final um, thought on this, uh, Janice, is um, uh, 
it, that's a tricky situation. Um, I, I've, I've dealt with similar folks in my life and I know it's very difficult to, to cope with that and to figure out, Hey, how do I navigate these waters in a way that, uh, you know, I, I, I maintain good character while also dealing with the negativity that's flowing towards me. Um, and your choice is ultimately going to come down to how you evaluate it and how your family evaluates it and the decisions you reach together. Uh, I do commend you though, that you're grappling with these things and you're thinking about this and you're calling in and putting yourself out there and talking to us about these issues and getting our opinions. Absolutely. Um, that's, that, Absolutely. that's more than other people would do. Does just the fact that you're self-aware enough to say, Hey, I need some external input. I need to really think these, th these things through. I think that's commendable. And I, I wish you luck in, in, in this difficulty that you're facing. I know it can't be easy. It's very similar to my story with my mom. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that with us. <clears throat> As we said on the top of the Can show. I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can I ask one more question or, or maybe layer into the whole my sort of tongue in cheek description? Um, an example of what where I'm like, I want to be a jerk back is so I, I've learned as an adult, I'm dyslexic, uh, most likely have ADD and quite possibly have autism. These are all things that as I talk to him, it's, um, you know, these signs were there had he bothered to have me checked out. And so recently mm -hmm. he made a comment about watching a football game and being like, I saw the number seven on the screen and, and uh, I just couldn't understand what it was. And my mm -hmm. impulse in my head was to go, yeah, that's me every day of my life. The number seven could be a D, it could be a B, it could be an S, it could be any of a number of things. But because you didn't get me checked out for dyslexia as a kid, I've had to live it with my whole life. So, fully for you, you had to have a stroke to know what it's like to be me for a day. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of that, do I be a jerk back thing? Because through the neglect of my developmental disabilities... I've had a lifetime of struggle of, you know, it took me until I was in my thirties to learn I was dyslexic. That, that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, so that, you that's can, part of that, you, you can know. answer that question yourself. I know you don't really mean that as Eric said, but you see the repercussions of him being a jerk to you. And you know that yes. behaving yes. that way to another person does the same thing. It's, it's, it's tit for tat and right. it doesn't benefit anyone. Um, right. And I, I, I think, my mouth shut and I just let it talk. Yeah. I don't think it's going to benefit him. If you do retort back, it's just going to lead to a fight. Um, you just want to find a place as best you can to where you can be at peace. And as we said at the top of the show, you try the best you can with every relationship, whether it's family or whatever kind of relationship. And do the best you can to be at peace with all men, but it doesn't always, it's not always in your control. And there are situations that are toxic and abusive and dysfunctional. And in those, sometimes in those instances, you, you have to get away from them for your own mental health and emotional health. And you've got a family to take care of. So you can't sacrifice everything at the altar of this man who won't even let you help him and maybe even can't get help. So you're doing the best you can, but you're going to need some professional help, I think, to navigate it, um, oh, yeah. to, to keep yourself safe. Yep. Well, thanks again for calling in and for at least like Eric said, you've got the awareness to know that you've got a, a handful there and that you're doing the best you can with it. But. I appreciate it. Call Thank back you. Let, it, let us know how it's going. Yeah, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Giannis. Bye-bye. That's a tough one, man. Um, as many of these are, these family situations. Yeesh. Yeah. I, uh, I don't, I feel for him. Um, we've got uh, Super Chats coming up. It's not too late to get them in if you want to support the show. Any super chat of $5 or more, and Eric or myself will read it on the air starting now. Go, Eric. Oh, man, hold on. I got to move this off my screen or else it's backwards. You should probably go first. Take this first one. All okay. Right. Here we go. Atlas Die, $20 from Atlas Die. Hi, Dave and Eric. Lost my dog last week. As you know, Dave, yes, I remember that. I'm so sorry. 
taking time to grieve, and some neighbors sent the Mormon missionaries. I hate that they go for those that are in a time of weakness. Carpe the fucking diem. Oh, my God, they came after your vulnerability. I'm so sorry. That yeah. just sucks. I, a neighbor I can't sent them on you. Ah, I can't stand. They're not all like this. Some of them are vulture Christians, the ones that they yeah. circle until yeah. they see their opportunity. Like, oh, you have a death in the family. Oh, you loved one broke up with you. Uh, your mm -hmm. dog died. And then they swoop in to exploit your emotional weakness to give you the good word. Um, yeah, I, just, I, I can't stand that. I've seen it happen real time back when I was out in field ministry. Uh, ugh, it makes you just feel dirty thinking about it. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry about your loss. I know you're... I know you're nicer than me, Atlas, but I hope you told them to go fuck themselves. But you probably didn't. <laughs> you probably were really nice. But but not in an ironic way, which we tell Jimmy. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, four ninety nine from Maddie Sheppy. My father left home when I was four. I grew up with visitation for my youth. He paid and honored. Good man. Pastor, I don't believe. He knows not. Tips? Uh, that's a lot of sentences. Um yeah i don't know translate that Eric. i think it's yeah so uh father left when he was four he had visitation he paid and honored so your father uh fulfilled his obligations under whatever court ruling was uh in place for you know how he would support you and your mother it sounds like um that's all great he honored his agreements he cared enough to give you guys what you needed to survive and that's a good thing i mean while you're in a mission he's a good man sounds like you have a good relationship uh if he's still here uh, pastor, you don't believe, so you guys are at odds with your with your religious inclinations, but you still have a good relationship, it seems. You still have that, and that's that's great. That's awesome. Uh, he, he knows not. Know, I'm though. not sure how to... He doesn't, he doesn't know that he doesn't believe. Oh, he doesn't know. Oh, oh, oh. It's guess, like a riddle. Yeah, we're, a having to, we're having to riddle this out. This kind yeah, of <laughs> yeah, I can unravel this. This is fun, though. Um, I guess tips. I mean, you're not here, Maddie, but I mean, I wonder, I, I'm curious how you anticipate your father to behave or to act towards you. Were you to tell him that you didn't believe? Um, that would be an interesting conversation. But um, if you feel, for instance, you know, when I left my religion, I had every single person that I knew and grew up with, I had to ask myself, what would happen if I told this person that I no longer believe? Right. And right. that's, that was almost agonizing because there was people I wanted to talk to, but I knew that, you know, once you start talking to them, they're going to gravitate towards, Hey, have you gone to meetings lately? Oh, Hey, you moved. What congregation are you in right now? Mm -hmm. what do you think about that watchtower study last week? You're going to, you're going to have questions that are going to eventually reveal that you're not in. Um, and I tended to avoid conversations with that. And I regret some of that. And probably I was, it was the right call for some other people. Um, so yeah, something you got to ask yourself is, is, is how would you behave and, and would it enhance your relationship were you to reveal that to him? If it's better yeah. to, Keep that to yourself because you're under no obligation to share your secrets with your father or anybody That's else true. for that matter. That's if your I've secret is said. your secret. Yeah. You don't owe um, anyone any explanation. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. But, we're always reluctant to give advice on how to come out, when to come out, if you come out to anyone, yeah. but you just have to measure the the cost benefit again. Uh, yeah, that, as Eric that, said, you know, what what will it do? What what do you expect it might do? and net, take your time net benefit analysis yeah net benefit analysis will enhance or, or diminish your relationship and a, a caveat with that is you could think i'm not i have no idea about your relationship with your father and how well you know him but i've heard stories of many people saying i thought i knew my mother until i told her i didn't believe anymore and then yeah. things changed and they were shocked mm -hmm. they were like many are are like I thought they were going to accept me. I thought they were going to just say, okay, and just move on. But it just, it completely ruined the relationship unexpectedly. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it it's, can go, it's, it's, even, it can go either way and you never, you never yeah. know. So just tread, tread carefully is all I could say. Even with the most thorough analysis, it could completely go sideways and it's, it's really difficult to, to make a call on that. Five bucks from the Raven 200, he, him, the Andrew call in checklist, make baseless claim, check, get challenged on claim, check, use special pleading for claim, check, learn nothing, comma, repeat. Yep. That's his MO and many like tracker, callers right? like him. Yep. Thanks, Raven. I, I enjoyed that conversation with him. It was my first time. I, maybe others are more tired of him than I was, but I mean, he, he answered questions, honestly, he, 
he paused to think, which I really appreciated. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think though, like just he just had com confirmation bias, and he was really looking at the evidence very loosely and, and only picking out what really supports him. Um, I hope he takes some yeah, things from I the conversation. Think we've we'll seen see. him. I think we've seen him before. He does have a uh, more of an even tone and a, a gentle tone, but I think that's part yeah. of the package with him. He's still yeah. not not really listening. Um, but you know what? Yeah. We don't do it to the ones less, uh, that are calling. We do it to the ones watching. So there's, yeah. that's at, what we're doing. At the very minimum, it was a solo conversation, and I really appreciate that. So Exactly. Um, so, so thank you, Andrew, if you're still listening. Uh, $10 from Panda. Uh, one of the best shows on the line. I totally agree. Thank you, guys, thank for you. everything that you do. Hearts. Thank you, Panda. Thank you for that, Panda. That. I appreciate it. We try five dollars, five bucks from Monkey at Typewriter. Much love to Giannis. I said his name wrong at the beginning. You corrected it very well, Eric. Thank you. My father was a near it. perfect. I, I only corrected it because I saw somebody, somebody in the, the chat. chat. It. I, I can't. I can't take credit for that. <laughs> My father was a near perfect example of what not to be. Now that I'm a father, I try every day to be nothing like him. CTFD guys. Yeah, it's a tough yeah. one. I. There's a lot of anger with Giannis, what this guy has done, his dad has done to him, and he's in a tough, tough spot. So I'm really hoping yeah. he can navigate that. Yeah, break the cycle. And there we go. Yeah, we're, yeah we're, that's we're the only... thing. Go, doing, doing it back to him is only going to keep the cycle going. His kids are going to see that, and, yeah. and it's going to be the same yeah. thing over and over. We're we're only anyway slightly different from the rest of the apes. It's it's still very much in our nature to harm back what harmed us, tit for tat. And it's 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 a base mm -hmm. instinct that's easy to get get into. And um yeah, it's it's something you gotta avoid or else the world's never gonna get Absolutely. better. Absolutely. Your train. Well, thank you, Eric, for being on here tonight. This was good tonight. We had some some good conversations. Thanks everyone who Absolutely, called Dave. in, everyone in the chat room. The chat moderators and Morgan for producing, and um, yeah, I just love being here every week. Come, I don't have the schedule. You got, we got, we got shows there all every night of the week. So tune in. Uh, you know, you know the drill, folks. So thanks for supporting the line again. Patreon.com/slash Call the Line, and we appreciate everyone tuning in each week. And we'll see you next week. And as we roll out. We have a list of our patron supporters on the scroll. Thanks again, Eric. Thanks, Dave. It was a pleasure. Yeah, always. And we are rolling. I'm start dancing. Out. There we go. No music. I'll start I dancing know. anyway. There it is. I hear it now. There it is. You brought it. You brought the music. <laughs> brought the music. Thanks, crew. You make it happen. Yeah, thanks to the moderators. You guys are awesome. And the audience. Why are we in the audience? Thanks, audience. Appreciate it. Love you guys. <laughs> I'm going to keep on dancing. Is that how you dance, really? That's exactly how I dance. The only move I know.